Well, I'm excited to be here in Lugano, uh, and uh, I, I've been attending the Lugano meeting every two years, gosh, uh, uh, for the last 10 to, or more years, and I think that this is probably uh, one of the most exciting meetings that I've been at. And I think, you know, uh, what I'm hearing uh, at some of the sessions uh, is that there is really gonna be a transformation in uh, in the field of lymphoma therapeutics, and we are going to be able to help many more people and save many more lives than, we, than we've uh, been able to in the past. Um, and uh, uh, there's many uh, approaches that are promising and uh, a lot of excitement. It's, there's a lot of good science, apl good applied science, and it, it makes me uh, very excited. Anyway, um, I got to present the work that uh, I did uh, uh, sponsor, that was sponsored by Novartis uh, that was a large multi-center global trial of a genetically engineered T-cell therapy for relapsed or refractory diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. I'll give you a little background on this and then tell you um, why, why I'm, this is among one of the areas that I think is going to transform the field and save lives uh, because it serves an unmet need. Uh, the, um, so. Uh, the, the concept here is that you, you can collect normal peripheral blood T lymphocytes from patients and you can genetically modify them to express receptors that will bind to proteins on the surface of the malignant cells. So in this case, the, the malignant B cells in diffuse large B cell lymphoma express CD19, as do normal B cells, and the receptors on, that, that are expressed in the genetically modified T cells um, bind to CD19. And when the T cell binds that chimeric receptor to the target cell, it then kills the way a T cell kills uh, a virally infected cell or other cell, uh, like it, for example, in a, tra in a transplant setting, um, uh, very effectively. So if you ever had a doubt whether T cells could cure cancer, uh, they can, okay? And this is one way to get them to do it, all right? It's, you know, I remember years ago, people used to debate that, but it's, it's history, okay? Um, anyway. Um, so how do you do this? You know, you, you, put, you do leukapheresis on a patient, you collect the lymphocytes, okay? Um, now, I'll give you some of the details in our process that's different from others, and it's important in how you interpret data as well uh, later, but just in general, you leukapheresis, you collect the T cells, you set up a culture system, and then you need a way to get the gene for the receptor into the T lymphocyte. So what we use is a lenyviral vector. It's a crippled AIDS virus. It has the virulence genes removed. It can't replicate itself, um, and, uh, but it can, like the AIDS virus, get into a T cell, get its genes into the nucleus, have those genes translated or transcribed and then translated and expressed into protein receptors on the surface for CD19 in this case. Um, there are uh, other retroviruses that have been used and some of the other CAR T cell approaches use alternative viruses. Um, we'll, we'll get back to that in a bit, maybe. Um, so once these cells have been genetically engineered, they're then, in, they're then uh, given to a patient following uh, a lymphodepleting chemotherapy regimen to make a sort of a vacuum into which these cells can expand. We give some lymphodepleting chemotherapy, give the cells, then we follow the patient for toxicity and response. Um, and, uh, and that's where we'll get into talking about a little bit of the statistics and the outcome. So that's the general scheme. Um, uh, we, I'll start with some of the results I presented on behalf of the Juliet trial, which is the multi-center trial that Vardis sponsored, and then, uh, and then I'll get back a little bit to my own work and then a little bit back to how I think people should look at the data based on methodologic differences in, in study design and car cell production, okay? And again, these are my own opinions. I don't represent uh, anyone other than myself, so if uh, you disagree with me, it's with me, okay? Um, anyway, um, so, um, so let me say that uh, we observed at three months a 37% complete response rate, okay? Why does that excite me? Well, these are patients with a relapsed or refractory diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Half of them had failed transplant early on after bone marrow transplant, and the other half were never eligible for transplant because they couldn't obtain enough for remission. So these were patients where there was no 
alternative therapy. So 40% of, or 37% are in complete remission. That's very good. Of course we'd like 100%, 40, or 37% is fine. For now, we will do better. And uh, the question is how long will that last, okay? So I can tell you, I did a, my own phase one, two study at Penn with the same system that we exported globally um, in the Juliet trial. In fact, my trial was uh, kind of the basis for the, the multicenter trial. And what I can tell you is I got 40% in my diffuse large B cell lymphoma patients. So imagine how close that is. All over the world, you know, 27 different centers uh, are, uh, in 10 countries on four continents, a bunch of different investigators, and they come up with 37% CR rate, and I had 40%. That's very close. So obviously, this is a technology which is going to be of use to uh, you know, lots of uh, uh, people. It's not something that's going to be restricted. This was a global study. And um, the other thing I can tell you about my study, and I have two to three years of follow-up on these patients, is every patient that achieved a CR at, at three months that was still in CR at six months, and most in CR at six months, or, or three months, were still in CR at six months. Only PRs were an except, the exceptional resp uh, responders. All the CRs have remained in CR two to three years later, okay? So I believe this multi-center study duplicated the response rate I achieved. I'll bet they're gonna duplicate the durability. So the excitement is, I believe I've cured these patients. Most people agree that these aggressive diseases, if you're alive without any evidence of disease beyond two years, that's pretty darn good, okay? Two years is a, is a benchmark, and we've achieved that. Okay, my study was small. It was, um, um, you know, in large cell cohort that we that got the same vector that I'm dis discussing for the Julia trial. We treated 14 patients, but um, um, you know, this the, with the data I presented on behalf of the Julia investigators was uh, 51 patients. It was an interim analysis, and now we we will ultimately present data on 85. And we actually enrolled. 85 was a protocol specified. We enrolled 141. So there's going to be a lot more data coming. This was the first look. And at three months, 37% were in CR. I don't care about overall risk. I only care about CR, okay, because I know that that's all that counts. And if you can achieve a CR beyond three, three months or beyond, you're almost certainly going to stay in CR. That's my experience with this vector that uh, uh, I have uh, three years' worth of experience with. Okay, so. Um, what, how were we able to do this in, all over the world? You know, it's complex. Well, it's cryopreservation. So what, what's different between our trial and, the other, and, and many of the other CAR trials is that we actually collect the, the peripheral blood mononuclear cells by phoresis. We freeze them. So they can be sent to a centralized production facility. They don't have to be made on site. And in, it was, most of them were made in New Jersey, Morris Plains, New Jersey. And some are now being made in Germany. Um, but we send the frozen cells there. The cell, cells, cells are thawed. They're cultured and transduced with the uh, lentiviral vector. And then they're refrozen and shipped back to the site. That freezing gives the treating physician a lot of flexibility. Okay? So if you're, these are unstable patients uh, that have DL, diffuse large B cell lymphoma, very unstable patients. We'll talk about that in a minute. But, but uh, to stay stable for a month, it can be difficult sometimes. And sometimes if a patient even gets an infectious disease like the flu, that's been shown in the leukemia studies, to markedly increase, even fatally, the toxicity from this form of therapy. So what if somebody gets the flu when your product is ready to go? You know, well, if it's frozen, you can wait for the patient to get better and then treat. So there's many, many benefits to cryopreservation. Um, and that is the reason that we were able to make this into a global trial. And uh, it's been exciting for me because as the principal investigator, I got to visit a lot of continents, a lot of investigators, and talk about this subject that is um, uh, really exciting. And, and I think uh, everyone that was in, all the investigators are excited about it. Anyway, so what about this? So this multi-center global trial pretty much looks like the data I'm familiar with. Um, and I, again, follow-up is short but I expect it will unfold like my own. Um, how do we compare toxicities and efficacy versus other CD19-directed cars? How are they different? You know, uh, I believe all of the cars directed, that are being tested against CD19 are capable of 
inducing long-term disease-free remissions, you know, if you want to say cure, fine, in a proportion of large cell lymphoma patients. So I'm excited about all of them, okay? Any, any one, I'm excited about them all. What's different about ours, what's different about our study, I just want to make clear for people that when you look at the data, make sure you understand the methods because people are trying to compare statistics. Is my car better than your car? You know, is uh, Ford better than Chevrolet? You know, well, they use different viral vectors and different um, um, criteria for manufacturing and inpatient en enrollment. So let's start uh, with the cryopreservation issue. So when we wrote our, the Juliet trial, we, there was a huge demand. Everybody wanted to get on trial because, you know, it's the best thing out there based on the early phase data. And so we screened many patients, over 200, and we actually collected their their peripheral blood binuclear cells by phoresis, okay? And then as we were going through enrollment, okay? So we ended up enrolling patients. We'd already collected the cells and begun to manufacture them um, well, uh, well in advance of, uh, uh, of the maximum production capacity that we had at the end of the study. So we were at the beginning able to make a few products per week, so, you know, and here's this whole pool of people that have collected waiting for their product. You know, so it looks like you say, oh, well, there was an attrition rate. These people were enrolled and they never got their cells. And, you know, I look at this other trial and many more people got their cells. Maybe they produced it more quickly. No, no, no. The reason is we made cells for all these people and then we did our best to ramp up the production capability. So we handicapped ourselves. There was a lead time bias. We, we enrolled patients before we even had a secured manufacturing slot. Okay, whereas if I designed another trial where I had to use fresh cells and grow them and give them fresh back to a patient, I wouldn't enroll that patient until I had a manufacturing slot so the patient doesn't get counted. So, so, so you, don't, you can't compare the studies. You need to look at, at the time of enrollment versus the time the patients were infused and why there may have been differences in that period. To some extent, you know, it's technical. If you if you've collected a lot of patients and the bottleneck is is how many cultures you could start a week, you know, that's going to lead to some patients having progressive progression of disease. We also allowed what we called bridging chemotherapy. So we thought if we collected a lot of patients and were ready to go, as long as the uh, treating doctors could give some forms of chemotherapy to keep the disease stable, we'd get these people eventually on to study. That's why we collected them and, and um, uh, in advance of, of production. By the end of the study, I can tell you, uh, we were producing like mad, and uh, the production time, uh, I think the, the, the production time was down to around 28 days or so uh, by the last 30 patients, and there's been continuing improvements. About 22 days now is the goal, and we're just about there to make cells for patients. Um, but the, the uh, again, you know, I think that um, these are very aggressive diseases and, and, and these people are immunosuppressed and vulnerable and they may have become clinically unstable and not be able to get their cells even during a three week period of time. That's why I like cryopreservation because you'll get more patients to their cells. So keep in mind this, this attrition rate, you know, um, um, is, is not something you can compare between studies. Now, you know, toxicities. So we use the PEN scale Okay, we handicapped ourselves because our scale, every most investigators in the car business use the Lee scale. Uh, the Penn scale, to make it simple, simple is we grade everything one degree higher than the Lee scale. So a grade two CRS on the Lee scale is a grade three on the Penn scale. So if you want to compare studies, shift ours down a grade and then you can compare them with the other reports. Okay, and I think we had grade three or greater of about 25% uh, uh, grade three or grade four, and no grade five, nobody died of CRS. And again, if you shift these down, the toxicity profile is, is, is very, quite good. And I think that relates, getting back to some of this, to the viral vector. I think that the um, virus we use uh, has a costimulatory domain in the, in the chimeric receptor that's the 41BB domain. That leads to, a, a, I think, a little more gradual production of the cells, a gradual expansion, I should say, not production, gradual expansion of the cells in vivo once you transfuse them. And I think that that very rapid early expansion uh, is more likely to result in cytokine release syndrome and toxicity. So, so 
pay attention to the costimulatory domains and I think you'll find that it ends up relating to the two uh, most concerning aspects of therapy, cytokine release syndrome and then neurotoxicity. Okay, so we saw no deaths from neurotoxicity in, uh, actually at all yet. Uh, we, although we presented da efficacy data on 51 in, for the Juliet patients, we actually have safety data on 83, okay, and no cerebral edema, okay. And um, um, the neurotoxicity was generally mild, uh, maybe some confusion, uh, some word finding difficulties, et cetera, generally self-resolving in five, six, seven days, not really needing any kind of therapy. So um, uh, I, I believe from a neurotox standpoint and a cytokine release standpoint, we have a pretty safe product. And uh, that's supported by the fact that we could export this product around the world and have everybody get the same results that we got in Philadelphia. And I believe that uh, because of uh, these features, the, the, the relative safety, certainly justified vis-a-vis uh, -vis the disease, any degree of risk. And um, the, the relative safety of this, uh, as well as the, um, um, uh, the flexibility that's given when you use the cryopreserve product, to use your best clinical judgment in terms of timing of administration, um, uh, is, gonna, is gonna make this a product that gets out into the use in many hospitals, in many centers, not just university centers that are doing research. It's honestly, um, like I said, 27 centers, and um, some of these people were not bone marrow transplant physicians, and you know we did very well. So I'm excited about these results. They're going to continue to mature. If the durability is anything like my pilot or early study, it's, it'll be a home run uh, for these patients that don't have any other options. And I think that uh, uh, this is some of what we're, you know part of what's going on at this meeting. There's many other exciting things. It's it's a good time to be in this business because um, I think. Uh, we have these emerging new technologies that we're going to be able to apply uh, um, in our practice to help a lot of people.